As Alan just introduced me, uh, what we do at Dare to Dream is we're a, a woman-led non-profit organization. I don't do this all by myself. I have four girlfriends who help me do a lot of things. And what we do is we organize inspirational uh, events around the world where women share their stories with girls from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the aim with our events is simple. We want to ensure that these girls, if they have dreams, believe that if you can dream it, you can do it. But I don't just want to talk to you about what we do tonight. Much more importantly, I want to talk to you about why we do it. And for me, that why starts with the fact that I grew up in South Africa, one of the most beautiful countries in the world during one of the most violent times in its history. I lived there from the age of eight until I was 24. And often people ask me, what was it like? And then I say, well, it was beautiful and it was surrealistic and it was cruel and it's very difficult to explain, but maybe the best way to explain to you is to give an anecdote. I remember once, I think I was about 14 years old, cycling to a friend's place on a Friday night to go and watch MTV videos. Those were the times of MTV, Duran Duran and VHS tapes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we hung out in his bedroom, a whole group of us. Um, I'd cycled there, left my bike in the driveway, came back out at 10, 11 o'clock my bike was gone. So I told my friend's dad that my bike was gone. He called the cops. He said to me, hang around, went back into the bedroom. 20 minutes later, his father walks in, big, burly Afrikaans man, moustache. And he says to me in Afrikaans, come saam, the police is here, ons gaan kijk. So I follow him. Down the driveway, it's dark, follow him down the driveway, we come out into the street. And there in the light of a, a street lamp, I see a police van parked, the kind they use to take prisoners to jail. And next to the van, I can see two uniformed police officers talking to each other. And as we walk closer, just beyond them, I can see a young guy lying face down in the street. And I remember seeing his hands were shackled behind his back. And as I came closer, I realized that his head was trapped between the curb of the sidewalk and the policeman's boot. So the policeman stood with his boot on this guy's head. And while he stood like that, he was talking like this to his colleague as if this is the most normal thing to do in the world. And I remember at that point seeing the scene as a 14-year-old girl and, and there was a scream caught in my throat and I, 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 I wanted to say a million things. I wanted to say, no, don't do it. And I, I, I didn't understand and I didn't say anything. And I remember that that was probably the first time in my life that I realized that dreaming wasn't created equal for all. But there are other misconceptions we have about realizing our dreams. And I think one of the most important misconceptions is the picture we have of success. The theme of tonight's event is sharing inspirational stories. Here's what we do when we share inspirational stories. We talk about what I call the glory story, the moment someone is awarded a Nobel Prize, or the minute they win an Olympic medal. And then what do we talk about? All the achievements that precede that moment of glory. We never, ever talk about the rocky road to success. We don't talk about the struggles and those minutes where you just feel like giving up. You know, those times, we don't include that in our stories of success. And here's the thing, if we want to change the way people think about realizing their dreams to be an attainable something to do, we have to change the stories we tell about success to be more realistic. We have to ask the hard questions to people. So, did you ever think of giving up? You know, did you ever think, what the hell am I doing here? That's what we have to do, change the story. And that's exactly what we're going to try and do with Dare to Dream. We're going to try and change the stories we tell about success. Let me give you an example. At our event in February, four very successful South African women will talk to 220 girls at Claremont High School in Cape Town. A little aside on Claremont High School. Claremont High School is a science and maths school specifically for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. That means they service all those outlying areas, the shanty towns around that beautiful little tourist spot called Cape Town. 
Those kids come from those shanty towns. What does this mean? The biggest township of South Africa is located just outside Cape Town. 1.2 million inhabitants. Most of those houses don't have electricity. Most of them don't have running water. Violence is rife. Alcoholism is rife. Yet some of tomorrow's brightest leaders live in these shanty towns. Claremont High School every year gets more than a thousand applications for the hundred spaces it has available. They pay the tuition fees for these kids, so they're trying to do everything to get them in there. Still, the competition is hard. Back to our speakers, the four successful South African women. One of them is called Kanji Chaba. Kanji today holds a top position with one of South Africa's biggest banking groups. She has a CV that can get her into any boardroom anywhere in the world. She's been in the media because of all the work she does uh, with mentoring kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. But Kanji has her own story of hardship to tell. Kanji was raised by a single mother who didn't have a formal job. When she finished high school, or middle bar school, like you say in Belgium, she went and worked for an architecture firm. And she told me, you know, Sabine, I used to walk around there all day long watching these people work in this architecture firm. I, I dream about how I'd love to be working in architecture or construction. So what did she do? She worked, earned some money, because in South Africa, tertiary education isn't uh, subsidized as it is in Belgium, so it's really expensive. So she would work, save some money, go and study for a year, then stop, go work some more, earn some more money, go study again. That's how she earned her degree. And when I spoke to her about it, she gave me, she told me a story. She said, you know, Sabine, it's like when I um, summited Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in, um, in Africa, which she climbed a few years ago. She said to me, it's not about the 15 minutes I spent on the summit. It's about the journey against all odds that got me there. Another one of our speakers called Dr. Zama Katamzi. Zama is 32 years old. Uh, she is a space physicist with the South African National Space Institute and she holds degrees in topics I can't even pronounce. Can you imagine what her parents must have said the first minute she came home and said, you know what I'm going to study? Space physics. That's what I'm going to do. Or our third speaker, Asnath Mahapa. Asnath is the first black female commercial airline pilot in South Africa. She's a woman. She's black. She's become a pilot. Today she flies for South, for South African Airways, their Boeings and their Airbuses. So, yeah, imagine when she first came home and said, I'm going to be a pilot. Honey, you're black, you're a woman, nobody's done it. She had to do it as the first woman in South Africa. Those are challenges to overcome. For us, those are the women that simply or, or embody the concept, dare to dream. Dare to dream. But you know, it's all good and well for me to stand here and tell you, oh, you must dare to dream, you must believe in your dreams and go for it. Life isn't that simple, and life isn't that black and white. Let me tell you what happens when uh, five women decide to found an organization called Dare to Dream. Five friends sit around in January 2013, our first meeting to found the nonprofit. And around the table we had Inika our media guru and organizational wonder woman. We had Sarah Eckhart, um, who's a, a promising young photographer. Um, we had Sally, who's just finished her degree in an international business studies. And we have Janita, our PR whiz kid, and myself. Here we go. We're going to found Dare to Dream. But if you listen carefully, you would have heard that we are all active in sectors that are prone to be hit by the crisis. And boy, were we hit by the crisis. We all started to get less and less work. I can't tell you how many meetings were started with phrases such as, and, are you earning enough money to survive this month? No, not quite, and you well, I don't know, I'm struggling, but it's okay. And a lot of people said to us, come on, you can't do this project right now. You really shouldn't be focusing on, on a project which is not earning you any money. And perhaps they were right. We could have done one of three things. One, we could have put our head under the covers and hoped it all got better really quickly. Or secondly, we could have run around like chickens without a head and tried to find the first best job we could find. Or number three, 
we could invest the time that suddenly we had in a project we really believed in. And we did. Because here's the thing, how can we as an organisation say dare to dream to girls who have so much less than we do and who face so many more great challenges than we do when we can't even do it ourselves? Because that's what it's about, isn't it? It's daring to dream in the face of your current situation and in the face of people telling you you can't do it and in the face of that little voice inside your head that says you're crazy or as the poem on our website goes it's impossible said pride hmm? it's risky said experience it's pointless said reason give it a try whispered the heart so here's the thing if we can do just that with all the girls at our events, just get them to listen to their heart and give their dream a try, despite all the challenges and the problems that they will face, then we've reached our goal. Thank you very much.